marching in. When the saints go to marching, what I want to be in that number. When the saints go to marching. Good morning. Thanks again for listening, and I trust the Lord will speak to our hearts today and use a message that uh, God laid upon my heart to meet our spiritual needs. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to be uh, looking into 2 Timothy chapter 3, and uh, while we're turning in our Bibles for that, let's uh, go ahead and sing the new song that we're singing since the first of the year. Our welcome song. Bright in the corner where you are. Bright in the corner where you are. Someone far from harbor you may guide across the bar. Bright in the corner where you are. Well, in just a few moments we'll be looking in Second Timothy chapter 3. And while you're turning there, let me tell you this story I heard of a pastor of a country church who had been studying all week preparing for his message on Sunday morning. But the uh, Saturday night before Sunday morning, there came a horrible snowstorm. And uh, on Sunday morning when he got to church, he discovered that only one farmer showed up uh, for the message. And so the pastor uh, told the farmer, said, well, it looks like uh, we'll just cancel the services this morning. The old farmer looked at him and said, well, you know, preacher, he said, when I go out to feed the cattle and only one cow shows up, I feed them. And so the pastor said, well, uh, all right, if, if, that's, if you want a message, I'll be glad to do it. And uh, so the pastor began to preach his message and it took 45 minutes. And when he got through, he looked at the farmer and said, well, what did you think? And the farmer said, well, he said, when I go to feed the cattle in the morning and if only one shows up, I feed him, but I don't shovel off the whole load. <laughs> well, uh, sometimes uh, we uh, don't know what to expect. Uh, and uh, I guess, uh, you know, when you come to church, you have a right to expect certain things and have the right to expect a message from God's Word. Um, uh, you expect to hear the truth. And uh, I know some of you are probably saying, well, yeah, I expect to hear better jokes than I've been hearing. Well, uh, whatever you expect, but I believe that as a pastor that I need to preach the truth, 
preach a message from God's Word, and uh, one that would help to encourage and challenge and prepare you for your walk with God. So today, thinking about our life for Christ, I want to speak on the subject of what should we expect? What should we expect? In other words, what does God really expect of us? What should we expect Him to expect of us, or however you want to say it? But uh, the truth is, God doesn't leave us in the dark. And so I want us to look in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 1, it says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times, that word perilous means dangerous, times shall come. Back in Matthew, when Jesus was talking to his disciples and giving them some signs to look for, uh, for the return of Christ, he said, you shall hear of, of wars and rumors of wars. And then he went on to speak of famines, pestilence or pandemics, and uh, earthquakes and uh, deceivers and uh, increased iniquity that will abound. Well, think of the things that are going on in our society today. And, you know, as we look into a brand new year, maybe uh, we're not sure what to expect. And to be honest, I don't know for sure what's going to happen in uh, 2024. Uh, neither do you. Uh, but we should be prepared to expect what, <coughs> excuse me, to uh, uh, face whatever comes along that the Lord, as He Lord directs our lives. But I think today of uh, all the hatred that has been shown towards, uh, for example, the Jewish people, and not just in the Middle East, in Europe, but right here in America. In fact, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty shocking uh, to realize there'd be that kind of hatred towards any people. Anyone who knows the Scriptures and is paying attention to what's going on in the world, is go as I believe, will come to the conclusion that we are definitely living in the last days. Now think of the war in the Middle East, the growing anti-Semitic hatred toward Jewish people, as I mentioned, even in America. Uh, does it not remind us of Nazi Germany when six million Jews were killed between 1941 and 1945? We're hearing a lot of the word genocide uh, which is defined as intentional destruction of a people, usually defined as uh, ethnic, national, racial, or religious group that uh, someone sets out to destroy. And we witness uh, these genocidic, uh, genocide desires of people in our streets who want to destroy the Jews from the face of the earth. Others want to wipe America off the earth, Israel off the earth. Uh, great uh, hatred of those that want to uh, get rid of Christians as well. According to Open Doors USA publication, it says that Christians are the most persecuted religious group in the world. Think of that. Christians, the most persecuted religious group worldwide. Several years ago, the United States Department of State said Christians in more than 60 countries face persecution from their governments or surrounding neighbors simply because of their belief in Christ. Open Doors World Watch list of 2023 lists the countries in 2023 that uh, persecuted Christians the most. Uh, North Korea, number one. Somalia, number two. Yemen, number three. And then the list goes on to uh, list Nigeria and Pakistan, Iran, Afghanistan, India, Syria, China, and so on. I googled how many countries were there where the Bible was outlawed. And it's according to the Google search that I made, 52 countries are listed as banning the Word of God. And then think of the open border policies in place with the millions of people coming into the United States from 
uh, hostile countries like Russia, China, Iran, and so on, uh, the violence and the rising crime across our country is alarming, with many businesses closing, saying they can't afford to stay in business because of the lawlessness and the theft problem that's going on. And then in 2024, we have uh, growing concerns over p the political climate on this election year. And yet I want to remind you that 1 Timothy 1, 7, or 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. In other words, uh, you know, with all the turmoil that's going on in the world and all of the unrest, uh, we don't need to freak out. Uh, we don't need to become paralyzed with fear <clears throat> because we can be prepared and uh, for whatever comes down the road. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happen unto you, but rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. You see, my friend, we need to realize today that God is in control, and we need to let God be God. God knows what He's doing. Paul, the Apostle Paul, faced all kinds of dangers, and he said in Romans 8, 35 through 39, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, our distress, our persecutions, our famine, our nakedness, our peril, our sword, as it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Did you hear that? We're more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life. Now remember the question that was asked in verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And now we see the answer. He said, I'm persuaded that neither death, death can't separate us from Christ, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Yea, thou walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll feel, fear no evil, for thou art with me. So death can't separate us from Christ, nor life, nothing in this life, nor the angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Well, that's the reason Paul could have peace in his heart, and he could rejoice even in tribulation and in suffering. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. However, we can say, as Paul said, <clears throat> I'm ready to be offered. You remember in Philippians 1, 21, he said, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. So whatever happened, Paul was prepared and he was ready and uh, he just waiting on the Lord to show him the next move. We are definitely living in dangerous times. I mentioned a while ago. I don't think anybody would argue with that. And many of us are not sure what to expect. And, uh, but we need to ask the question, what does God expect of us? Now, as your pastor and as a preacher, I, I have a huge responsibility I believe not only to help prepare folks for eternity, but also to prepare folks for the battles that we face in our service for the Lord right here on earth. Now, a few years ago, in the beginning of 2020, I started to preach a series of messages on 1 Peter. And I no more than was beginning to lay the foundation, the stage, so to speak, for our study in First Peter, when uh, the coronavirus came along and uh, we had to make a change in our services, and uh, many people were scattered for a time, 
And so God then led me in a different direction, and I ended up preaching messages about uh, messages of hope and uh, so on, got away from what I had planned to, to preach and teach in 2020. But now, once again, I, I believe God is laying upon my heart and uh, these messages, and I'm going to attempt to preach them in the next few weeks or months. And I ask the question, are we prepared if we are caught in the middle of a revolution? Are we prepared if severe persecution should break out in our nation against Christians? I believe in spite of living in dangerous times, we don't need to live in fear. And we can have victory in Christ, but we need to be prepared. And so these messages are intended to try to help equip us and prepare us for the challenges that may lie ahead. Someone has said you're not prepared to live until you are prepared to die. In the voice of the martyrs, uh, voice of the martyrs magazine, several years ago, told the story of something that that happened. I think now it's probably been about eight years ago, but the story was about a woman by the name of Regina Wilson, and she lived in a village where the terrorist group called Boko Haram attacked. And she was aware that it was a possibility that it could happen. And in that region, in fact, in the several years leading up to this incident, uh, over 17,000 people, mostly Christians, had been slaughtered for the cause of Christ. And Regina said, I once thought that even if I should be captured by the terrorists, I will never deny my faith in Christ Jesus. And so she said, and I quote in the article, so when we met them, my mind was made up beforehand since I know who I serve. I only remembered that Jesus told Peter, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And she said it encouraged me not to deny Jesus like Peter did. And that's what she was holding on to. She was captured. And within 24 hours of her capture, Regina watched Boko Haram fighters kill three men, including her oldest 16-year-old son. Another was a neighbor that they killed. They slit their throats, according to Regina, uh, Regina with uh, machetes and slaughtered them like rams. And although her son was taken from her, Regina thanks God for her because her son knew Christ. And then her 18-year-old daughter was kidnapped. And at the time the article was written a few years back, she was still missing. Her 8-year-old son lost an eye through all of the turmoil. But Regina and the family members ended up in a refugee camp. Regina said, and again I quote, My faith is strong. I am strong in the Lord. I will keep trusting Him more and keep holding on to Him. Now with what has been going on in our world, with the wars and the, uh, the turmoil that's going on even within our own country, I feel very strongly to preach through 1 Peter which was given to the Christians to help prepare them for hard times, for suffering, for persecution. In order to set the stage for our study in 1 Peter, let me give you some historical background as to what was going on. And uh, this message will serve, I trust, as a springboard as we dive into the book of 1 Peter. And I believe that God has much in there that can help us in these days that we live. Back in 64 A.D., the same year that 1 Peter was written, persecution was very severe 
under Nero. And Nero, let me tell you a little bit about him, became an emperor when he was 16 years old. Now, he became emperor because his mother uh, plotted uh, the death of her husband and his sons in order to clear the path for her son Nero, who was born by a former marriage. Nero was married for the first five years, so got married at a very young age, and in fact did a, apparently a pretty decent job as emperor. Then he was influenced by a wicked young woman by the name of Popea Sabina, who, was, uh, who he wanted to marry. And his mother took the side of his neglected wife. And uh, this made Nero angry, so he planned his mother's death. In order to do so, he devised a scheme by sending his mother on a boat trip. And he made sure that the boat was made to fall to pieces when it hit the rough water. However, the boat fell apart or fell to pieces so close to the shore that she was able to swim to shore. And so at this time, Nero uh, realized the situation he was in, and so he ordered his mother's death by swords, by executioners. Then he then had his present wife put to death. And that opened the opportunity for him to marry this woman by the name of Papia Sabina. And he began living a wild, reckless life. Nero built a huge palace called the Golden House. It was surrounded by gardens, lakes, baths, and so on. And in order to pay for his palace, uh, he would accuse rich people of crimes have them put to death, and then take their property. Sort of like, uh, remember Jezebel plotted the death of Naboth, and Paul had him falsely accused and uh, killed his family. And therefore, the property that uh, King Ahab wanted went to him because uh, it would go to the government when there was no family. Well, <clears throat> In July of 64 A.D., a terrible fire broke out in Rome. It burned furiously for about six days. And they say that Nero would ride in his chariot watching the uh, one half of Rome burn. And about the time they got it under control, the other half began to burn. And the word got out that Nero himself had had these fires started and was suspected of setting the fires just for the pleasure of watching them burn. And the people became very angry at Nero, thinking that he had done this. And uh, he began to get concerned about losing his uh, position as emperor. And so uh, it is said that he took money out of the treasure and went out and uh, threw it into the crowds of people on the street to try to appease them. But then he also began to spread rumors that it was indeed the Christians who had started these horrible fires. And they were to blame. And so as the rumors spread, people began to uh, have ill feelings toward anybody who claimed to be a Christian. And they, as uh, the king was blaming them, in fact, he ordered that they should be hunted down, tortured, and slain. Well, this is the same time of history, as you recall, when the Christians were gathered up and put into the Roman Colosseum. And uh, for sport, for people to watch as the lions were turned in on the Christians. Sometimes the gladiators would come out who were trained in fighting and uh, would uh, fight the, the Christians and kill them only for the delight of the people. 
Also during this time, it is said that Nero took some of the Christians and made human torches out of, torches out of them and would burn them. And at night as he rode his chariot uh, along through the path, it was lighted by Christians being burned to death. Strict laws were made by Nero forbidding secret meetings of Christians. And uh, when a uh, calamity would take place, maybe whether it be a flood or a fire or a famine, whatever happened bad, Christians were blamed. First Peter was written, as I mentioned a while ago, in the same year, 64 A.D. I believe that it was written to try to prepare and to help the Christians that were going through this horrible persecution. This was written about six or about four years before Peter was put to death by crucifixion, dying upside down on what is called Nero's cross. Historians tell us that he said, I don't feel worthy to die in the same way Christ did. And so they crucified him upside down. By the way, the Apostle Paul was beheaded under Nero, Nero's rule. And as I mentioned, First Peter was written to encourage these persecuted Christians, to instruct them in their behavior, to help them understand, and to equip them for what they were going to face. In chapter 1, for example, we're going to discover that God quickly reminds them that they were children of God, and that they were kept by the power of God. They had an inheritance reserved in heaven. They were saved by the precious blood of Christ. They had a blessed hope of the return of Christ. And in 1 Peter 1, 23, it says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Now you see, my friends, that makes all the difference in the world. If we know that we are children of God and that we have been born of God and that the Holy Spirit lives within us, that regardless of what happens, that's the reason we're to fear not those who kill the body, but fear Him who can destroy both soul and body. First, or John 1.12 says, But as many as received Him, to them gave He the power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on His name. Now, very honestly, we don't know what to expect. Uh, we would hope for the best of things, but we need to be prepared for the worst. And the way to be prepared is to be born again, to be a child of God. The Bible tells us, Jesus said, ye must be born again. And so today, my friend, as we begin to dive into 1 Peter, I want you to make sure that you have been born again. You say, preacher, how is it that you get born again? Well, again, let me read that verse in John 1, 12. But as many as received Him, speaking of Christ, to them gave the power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on His name. I became a child of God when I was 17 years old. I realized I was a sinner. I knew that I could not save myself. I'm certainly not a Savior. I had tried to turn over a leaf, tried to do better, but I'd always fail. And I realized through the testimony of a basketball coach by the name of Bruce Foster, he shared with me from John chapter 3 how I needed to be born again. And one night I realized that the Bible's right. I needed to be born again. And I remember kneeling by my bed and praying and calling upon Jesus and putting my complete faith and trust in Him to be my Savior and my Lord. God changed my life. You see, 
I believe by the grace of God that I'm prepared for whatever happens. And you can be prepared as well. I trust today that if you've not been saved, that you would receive Christ as your Savior. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, I uh, pray that we might realize that we live in very dangerous times. A lot of horrible things taking place in our world and in our society. But Lord, I'm thankful to, today that we can be born again and that you will save us and uh, make us a child of God if we by faith will call upon you and trust you to be our Savior. And so Lord, I pray that today that we might make sure that we have been born again. And Father, I pray as Christians that we might surrender ourselves, dedicate ourselves to your purpose and meet our spiritual needs, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And remember, the Lord is good. Tell it wherever you go. The Lord is good. Tell it that others may know. Tell of His goodness and tell of His love. Tell how He's coming from heaven above. The Lord is good. Tell it wherever you go. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. And thanks so much for listening.